Well, some of you can maybe relate to some of that. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's great. Uh, happy Father's Day, dads. And, uh, you know, all those realities uh, are, are a lot of fun. And, uh, but it's great being a father. And so I just want to pray for you dads today. So dads, you want to stand up? We want to acknowledge you today if you're a dad or if you want to be a dad. Or, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> happy Father's Day, guys. Happy Father's Day. Uh, I'm just going to pray. If you guys want to sit down, I'm going to pray for you, if you'd like. Um, Father, we come before you today, and as we uh, are able to laugh at this uh, video of all the, the different things that we go through as dads, Lord, we, we understand that uh, it's really an impossible task apart from you. And so, fathers, we're able to laugh a little bit about some of these things. We realize that uh, raising children is a very serious matter, and, and it's something that we certainly can't do by ourselves. And so today, as we look at your word, and we look at the, who you are and who you want us to be, and we thank you for being the great father who ultimately sent uh, his son to die for us and to pay for all our sins on Calvary's cross. And so we celebrate um, fathers, we, we thank you, Father, that uh, we can, as we look at your word, see who you are and who you're not, and that you are, a, you are our God. And so we thank you that you are our Father, and uh, you see what we need before we need it. You know our needs. You created us. You gave us all the, the emotions and, and abilities and strengths that uh, when we come to you, Father, you, you complete us. And we thank you that you've completed us through Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, we thank you again. Amen. So, dads, we want to throw you a bone to this morning, a lifeline, if you would. Uh, you know, as a father, uh, there's so many things you don't know, and as you get older and you raise kids and you look back and you think of all the things that maybe you could have done or should have done and uh, things that maybe you'd do different, uh, we realize that, that we come to this place where we understand what our, what our true needs are. And, uh, and uh, you know, before I go any further, I also want to thank the guys and the women who came out yesterday and helped with our projects around here, cleaning. So thank you very much for all your hard work. Some of the trees are missing now. Some of them have been pruned back. Uh, it's amazing. We've been in the building about 11 years and how things have just kind of overgrown. So uh, we're starting to actually pull some things out. But we're thankful to all you men and women who came out yesterday. Having said that, um, I just want to say, say one thing, dads need to know what they don't know. And you know, sometimes we don't know, and like this uh, video is showing us, um, I never like to admit I'm lost. Have you ever, guys, do you like to admit when you're lost, you've always got it figured out, you always know exactly where you're going, and you're just kind of taking the scenic route, or the long way around. And, uh, uh, and the reality is, we are lost apart from God, and, and even as we turn to the Lord, sometimes we kind of pick and choose what we're going to do as fathers. So uh, the first point I want to talk about uh, today in this area of, of being a father is a statement called real men. What, what, are, what does a real man, real men uh, do as they look to the father? So um, real men love Christ, love God. And so well, if we start out the foundation of our relationship with him as an individual, as a father, as a husband, we have to come back to this reality of that loving God with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul is important. In Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40, uh, the disciples came to Christ and they asked him, what, what is the greatest command? What, how do you put it all together? And Jesus said to love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and to love others as yourselves. So, so this idea of, of Jesus summarizing everything, it's to love God and to love others. So that sounds very simple, doesn't it? Especially if uh, the Jews being under the law, the Gentiles worshiping all these different gods. But to come to the point where we say to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul is to put him first in everything. And so as dads, as, as family members, this idea of always coming back to putting Christ first, putting our Heavenly Father first, coming to him before we get upset, before we get impatient, we come to him first and we recognize that he desires us to do that. He created us to seek him. He created us to worship him. He created us to know him. And that's primarily found in the word of God. So we come to the word of God. We come to this point of, of loving him. And then, of course, others. 
uh, is key. So, so to understand as a man, there's nothing to be ashamed about or to be embarrassed about the fact that you love God and, and that you have a burden to let him be known to the world around us. And so as, as people come to us, as men, other men look to us, as we get older, as older men with you know, trying to minister to younger men, we understand that that is the key to the Christian life, to seek the Lord, to seek the Lord, to seek him in the morning and the evening, and to devote our lives to knowing him better. Because if he is the creator of all things, if he is the sustainer of all things, then we need to come to him first for everything in our lives. Then the next part here, um, you know, is this reality of real men need to be humble. Real men need to be humble. And this is a difficult part of being a man because men are looked to as having all the answers. We've got all the answers to all the questions. I had a boss I worked for, and he had a statement all the time, and he would, he would make this statement, and he, and he was not a humble man. But his, his, his statement was this, I know all the answers to all the questions before they're even asked. And so, kind of hard to work for a guy like that who said, I have all the answers to all the questions before you even ask them. And he was a very successful businessman, and he did very well for himself, but he certainly didn't have all the answers to all the questions. And ultimately, he did come to know Jesus Christ uh, before I uh, left working there. A number of us were praying for him for years, and he did come to know Jesus Christ. But, but that, that pride... Boy, that is, that is the kiss of death, guys, that pride of thinking we've got it all figured out all the time because we, we feel that we have to have it all together all the time. And see, there's a, that fallacy, there is that lie that, that we need other people and we need God and we need to humble ourselves before a holy God. And so when we begin to understand that real men are men who seek to be humble and they seek to be able to admit they're wrong, they, they, they need to be able to say, well, I'm lost and I don't have a clue where I'm going. Right, guys? Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, that's, you know, and, and I love it when the GPS is wrong. You know, it's like, yeah, it's, have you ever, you've ended up on a dead end street or something or, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, but the reality is, is this is so important, this humbling ourselves before holy God, humbling ourselves to this point of, of what Christ did in Philippians chapter 2, it, it, gives, it gives us some great scriptures on the person of Jesus Christ and that the fact that he had, Jesus came as a man, God, who, who was part of creation, Jesus, God sent his son Jesus to earth to become a human being and to, to, to walk around in a, in a body of a man, uh, who, God becoming a man and walking around amongst us. And so that he came to this point of humility where he was willing to go to the cross. Scripture says, he, and he humbled himself, and he came to the cross, and he took on the sin of mankind. And then scripture says that he therefore was highly exalted above all that at his name, Every knee will bow and confess that he is Lord, ultimately, either in this life or when they find themselves before the great judgment. And so the reality is, every man, woman, and child who's ever lived will bow and confess that Christ is Lord. So that, that, that picture of this humility of Christ being sinless, becoming sin, God of, of all creation humbled himself and, and took on this form of a servant is incredibly powerful. It's incredibly humbling. And if Christ was able to humble himself and become a man, then we as men need to be able to humble ourselves and recognize our, our need and the fact that we don't always have all the answers to all the questions. And... Um, Recently, I found myself doing something where I, uh, you know how guys like to just say, I don't need any help. You know, maybe if I'm laying under the wheels of the car and it rolls over me, I'll ask for some help, you know, in that reality. But normally it's like, I got this, you know, I, I got this, you know, carrying refrigerators by yourself and moving furniture up and down the stairs by yourself or, you know, like just, just doing things that you know that you should probably ask a neighbor or somebody, hey, could you help me with this? But no, I, I got this. Can any of you guys relate to that? Yeah, yeah. So it's that humility of just saying, I need an extra set of hands or I'm going to just wait until somebody else can come and help me with this. And how many back injuries have there been and trips to the hospital and 
fingers cut off and snow blowers and such because of the fact that, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to take the time to get something to poke the snow out of the snow blower. Uh, in the emergency rooms, I've been told, you know, the first snowfall is they have a lot of visitors up there in the emergency room um, from, from member, uh, fingers being taken off by snow blowers. It's just kind of one of those things, and it's one of those things you could put it on the news at night saying, it's the first snowfall, guys, don't put your hands in your snow blowers, right? We do it anyway. It's just what it is. But this humility of, of seeing God for who he is, holy, perfect, righteous, all-powerful, coming to earth, becoming a man, dying for us, if Christ can humiliate himself and humble himself, we certainly as men can do that. So real men are able to love God, love Jesus, let, not be afraid to let others know it. Real men are humble men in the picture of Christ is such a powerful truth to keep him first in our lives to humble ourselves next real men are totally dependent on god they stand on the promises on their knees okay they stand on the promises of the truth of god but it's done on our knees and again humility this picture of humbling ourselves and getting down on our knees and seeking the lord and crying out to him when we don't know what to do or where to go or we need help or we don't know where to even turn for help it is that picture of humility being on our knees and i know i've shared this with you a million times that um you know one of the greatest pictures i have of my father was seeing him on his knees every night praying He'd get on his knees every night and pray. Even when he was in his, he, my dad passed away at 81 years old. My dad was always on his knees. And so that is a picture I will never forget. The fact that my dad knew when he needed help and he would cry out for that help. But in Philippians, again, uh, 4.13, Philippians 4.13 is a great verse. And it states this, I can do all things through Christ, who is my strength. Who is my strength. I just think that is such a great picture. I can do all things through Christ, who is my strength. So what that means for us as, as guys is that we understand that God has created us, put us in a certain place, certain family, certain job situation we're in, and we find ourselves in that place, and we find ourselves totally dependent upon God, and we're able to say, I can't do this, but God can I can't do this, but God can. And so you find yourself in those situations where you don't know how you're going to have the strength to maybe do what you're going to do or you're going to have to do or a decision you're going to have to make. And, uh, and those, those look like all kinds of different things. And, um, you know, I've, I've talked to different people with different jobs and different situations. And everybody, no matter where you work, you're going to find yourself in those situations where you're going to have to make some tough decisions. And those aren't easy things to do. And so you say, God, I can't, but you can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So what that means is very simply this, that I am looking to the Lord to give me the strength to do whatever he has me to do, whatever that looks like. And, uh, you know, I, I go back to when my first child was born, my daughter, um, and, and hearing her cry for the first time, it, it came over me like a, like a, like a tsunami now I'm a father, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, what, what, what am I going to do now with this little, this little baby? And uh, man, that's, that's scary stuff. And you, you know, if some of you remember back to that, and then the second one came, and that was scary, and the third one came, and that was scary, and, and, and it's still scary. You know, because it's like as we look at our children, we love our children, we send them out into the world and, and, and you know, the world comes around them and the boat is up and down and all kinds of things are flowing back and forth. Um, like he said, again, in that video clip, it's like, I got no problem with my toddlers, my infants, or my, my grown children or, or family members. And you find yourself saying, okay, God, you know, we want to fix things as men, don't we? Guys... Yeah, we want to fix things. I mean, we just think, well, get out the screwdriver. If that doesn't work, we get a hammer. If that doesn't work, we get a bigger hammer. And so we want to try to fix things. And we find ourselves, sometimes the more we try to fix things, the more we mess it up. But God, and that's what's great about stepping back, realizing that God has it. God is working in and through the lives of individuals, our, our families, doing things that we don't even know that he's doing. Isn't that great? I take great comfort in that because God loves our kids. Our kids are entrusted to us for a season, but they're his for eternity. 
They are his. And so when we understand that God's entrusted our families to us, and we're these dads, and we're trying to work through these things, and love our children unconditionally, there isn't anything that I, that I wouldn't do for my family. And I know you dads, there isn't anything you wouldn't do for your families. And so we find ourselves, though, as sometimes having to release those things that are going on around us and just say, God, this is beyond me. I'm going to trust you because you're greater than me. You're all powerful. You're all knowing. You know all things. You, you understand. You see the future. You're not confined to a time frame. We as, we as dads, we, we have these time frames where something has to be done right now or, or a situation because that's the world we live in. But God is working outside of time. He works outside of time. He's not confined to today or tomorrow. He is is omnipresent and he is omniscient. So he's able to know what needs to be done. He's in the process of working through things. I mean, I see this continually, how God answers prayer. When I see situations continually, when I, I step back and I think, oh, you know, sometimes you've, and you guys have had this, guys, ladies, kids, where something happens, and maybe it's a month or a day or a week or a year later, you look back back at something that took place, and you look at that and you go, ah, now I understand. Have you ever done that? Man, I'll tell you, that's, that's exciting. And that's, that's our God. He's doing things in his time frame, and that's an oxymoron, I understand that, but, but in, for our better terminology, in our time frame, God works out of time, but he's in the process of doing things moment by moment and second by second. I mean, there's sometimes I have prayed and God answers those prayers, boom, just like that, the phone will ring. I mean, I've had those times where I'll pray about something and the phone rings. And it's like, gee, that's fast. And other times, years go by, maybe a decade will go by, and if something you've prayed about, you look back on, and you're just like, oh, I see. Now I'm able to see what God was doing what he was doing in this process. But here's the beauty of this. As we humble ourselves before him and we become dependent upon him, we come to the place of understanding that we don't have to know and understand everything that's going on. We want to know. I I mean, I I like to know. I like to have the answers like my old boss used to say. I'd love to have the answers to all the questions before the questions are even asked. And that that that's how God's going to work in my life. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes you get those answers. Other times you get the big question mark. Why? I don't understand why. But God is a faithful God. He is a holy God. He is a righteous God. And so our dependence comes to him. So we start out again. Real men, we love the Lord. We seek the Lord in all things. Then we are humble. We seek him in humility, realizing we don't have all the answers. But then there's that total dependence upon him, where we understand that he is working in and through the circumstances, the situations, and we're able to step out of that and step back and see that, that God is someone as a person, as we look at him from a human perspective, as we look at Jesus Christ. You know, and this is the thing I love about Jesus. He was never late and he was never in a hurry. When we study the life of Christ, we look at Jesus' life, and when Scripture says and tells us, and at the perfect time that God anointed, that Jesus came, and he became a man, and he dwelt among us, and then ultimately was crucified, was raised from the dead. God was in this process of this timing. So we understand that that dependence upon him brings us to that place where we continually realize that God is someone we can trust because he is a God of his word. He is a God who follows through on what he has promised. When you look at all the prophecies of the Old Testament and how God worked through the Old Testament, and and now we're in the New Testament, at the New Covenant, and we see God's faithfulness working. And... uh, and uh, I, think, I think of situations where I've prayed for people that are like, they're in life and death situations. There are people this very moment who are in life and death situations serving God in different parts of the world. And you're waiting for those phone calls or you're waiting to hear what happened in this particular situation. And uh, things, that are, things that are just seemed like surreal. And then you hear how God has stepped in and how God was working and how God worked in through a horrible, something that was meant for bad, God turned around and used for good. It's, it's absolutely remarkable, and I'm continually amazed by that. Then the next point we hear is real men know how to stand firm. Standing firm is such a, a key statement. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 19, it gives this beautiful picture 
of standing firm. And uh, says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers in the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So there is this standing firm. We're living in a day and age today where we're seeing things happen every day. We, if you watch the news, and you can go crazy watching the news about this shooting or that shooting or, or this upheaval over here and all the instability of the world around us. So today it's, it's more important than ever that we as men stand firm on the convictions that we have that God is who he says he is, and that God has promised us that we will suffer persecution, and that God has promised that we're going to live through some difficult times, because that's the Christian life. Somehow our world today has made us think that the Christian life is an easy life, that being a Christian is something that's just kind of like you go buy a certificate somewhere, and you get all these great things that you know you get with this when you purchase this particular thing, you get all these benefits. Well, it is true what we receive is Christ, uh, from Christ, and our new position in Christ, and all that he has done for us. But Jesus said, as the, the world that we live in is hostile toward Christianity. Have you experienced that at all? It's hostile toward Christianity. The world is hostile towards Jesus Christ. The world hates Jesus. Satan hates Jesus, and he wants to do everything he can to undermine us as men, our families. Because as the family goes, so goes the country. So goes the world that we live in. And so when the enemy is attacking the family on every level, and attacking dads, who are the head of the home, everything gets turned upside down. And we're seeing that in the world that we're living in today. Everything that we know is under attack. Because if you say, I seek to live a righteous life, you're going to be attacked by the enemy. If you're seeking to do what is right in the workplace and be honest and have integrity, you're going to be attacked. If you're going to, if you're going to share Jesus with somebody, the enemy is going to attack you and find ways to discourage you and dishearten you. Isn't this a great message for Father's Day? Yeah, it, but it's the real world, folks, guys, you know. And so standing firm today, it's a military term, and it's the idea that you're standing and you're prepared to meet the enemy. You are prepared to meet the enemy. You stand firm. Uh, the shoes, the boots that they wore were special. Even back in the Roman Empire, as they were masters at taking countries and taking uh, cities and, and, and conquering the world, if you would, their, their armor, and that's why Paul refers to the armor of God, because everybody in the day and age understood Roman. They saw the Roman soldiers and how they fought and how they worked and how they used their shields and how they used their double-edged swords and even their footwear and everything they wore, their helmets. It was very intimidating, and they were masters. They were masters at standing and going against the enemy. So Paul uses these pictures for us as men because we like war movies, don't we, guys? I mean, we like action movies. I do. I like action movies or chase scenes in movies. I mean, we like action as guys. So Paul understood that, so he built into the word to help us understand we're, we are action soldiers in a world, and we are here to stand firm against the wiles of the devil, to stand against the evils of the world, and that you think, well, as a man, as a father, what can I do? I'm just one guy. You know what? You look at what one person did, Jesus Christ, in conquering and overtaking the world. When you look at what the disciples did, we're still talking about the disciples today, thousands of years later. Or Joshua, one of the greatest warriors ever, had to suffer, had to wait, had to wait on God. Joshua and Caleb, wonderful men who were, who were conquerors, they had to, they, they, the, the, the battles were won, but they still had to go and fight the battles. And when they followed God's leading, they won. If they disobeyed God, there was failure. It's the same thing in our lives as men. And when we obey God and we seek God, and we stand firm against what is, against what is evil, there's all kinds of things that are going on around us. We may not always see. It may seem like the darkest hour, and yet just the, at the other side of that darkest hour is a breakthrough. Have you ever seen that in your life where you're, you're in the grips of a battle, and right around the corner, and this is where the enemy is always whispering to us guys, 
just give up. Just give in. Just give up. Just, it's too much. It's too much. You can't do that. You can't do that. Being a father, you, you can't do it. You're a failure. Just give up. Leave. Um, you're, you're a husband. Oh, this marriage is too hard. I'm done. I'm done. Or, or you're in a situation where your job is just like, you know what? I'm done here. I'm out of here. You know, those break, there's breakthroughs. There's times. And there's sometimes things just don't work out. I get that. I understand that. We live in a fallen world. But you're at that place where you're, stand, you're to stand firm. And what do we want to do? We want to run. We want to run. Um, we have... Uh, Anne's living with us, and she has a dog, and this is a very skittish dog, and at the, the slightest sound, that dog cowers. It just does this, you know, like you slam a door, and the dog does this, or someone comes to the door, the dog barks, and as soon as they come to the door, the dog runs. Um, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a great picture, and we're, we're kind of that way. We're skittish sometimes, and we fear the unknown. We fear the unknown. We fear what we don't understand, but the Scripture is telling us that if we love the Lord, and he is at the center of my life, and I'm seeking him, that's crucial. And then if I'm able to humble myself and realize I don't have the answers, but I know the God who does have all the answers, that's when things begin to happen. And then when I realize I have to be totally dependent upon him, you know, there's no supermen, there's no superheroes, men of steel or Spider-Man or Iron Man or whoever the action hero might be, G.I. Joe, whatever. There's no superheroes, you know, we're just... We're just guys. And so when we understand that God is in this process of building Christ within us, a warrior's heart, having a warrior's heart is something that is really great to have. And it's something that God builds within us because somebody knocks on the door in the middle of the night and they want to harm your family. What are you going to do, guys? You know, nudge your wife and say, honey, you get this. Right? No, you're not going to do that. You're not going to do... Well, I hope you're not going to do that. But... You know, like when the power goes out at our house, I tell Marianne, just uh, the circuit breaker's in the basement. Just go down there and you'll find it eventually after you stumble over a few things. No, guys, we, you know, those, there's certain things. They're testosterone-driven, um, guy-thinking things that go through our bodies that are just natural. So when the enemy wants to do everything to make what should be natural to us as spiritual beings unnatural. So it requires energy and effort to do the right thing. Then this idea of standing firm comes to this last point, and I want to just get to this. Real men never give up. You know, you know, and you've all heard the story of Churchill. One of the shortest speeches he ever gave was at a university, and, and they asked him, you know, basically, you know, how did you win the war? How did you, you know, how did you do this? And he just stood up and basically said, never give up, never give up, never, never give up. One of the greatest speeches ever given, one of the shortest speeches ever given, but that's how the British pushed through with a stiff upper lip uh, through the Second World War when they were bombed and bombed and bombed. And I mean, they felt all alone and isolated. I mean, the crazy people were at their back door. Just never give up. And so as men, there's times where we just want to just stop. We just want to give up on everything. And God is saying, hang on. It's just around the next corner is going to be the deliverance from this situation. Or... Maybe you're going to suffer for a period of time in your life in this particular situation to do something to create within you a character and an integrity that's going to help you get to the next level and then get to the next level. More people fail succeeding in business than people... You, you just don't start a business normally and succeed. Most businesses that start fail. And yet people are crazy. And, and they're still... Millions of patents being filed every day by people who had an idea, a better mousetrap, whatever it is, they had a better idea. How many failures did it take? Edison, when he was trying to find out the, find the perfect element for the light bulb, I, I, don't, I forget how many thousands of things he tried that failed. But the reality was, he said, I, now I know what doesn't work. So he did find what did work. He never gave up. So for us as guys, this, this reality, and so I'm just going to read this, and I love this picture here of God's faithfulness in our lives. And, and one of the keys for men is to know when to ask for help. And again, we're not good at that. I'm not good at that. But to know when to ask for We never give up, but we know when to ask for help. And so I want to just share with you the idea of, uh, again, this picture. Jesus was a great, 
teacher um, with the narrative and, and the word pictures and things. So Jesus is in the boat. He's exhausted. He's with the disciples. Some of them were seamen. They, they've been at sea their whole lives. The storm came up, and the boat's rocking back and forth, and they're, they're afraid they're all going to die. And so they, they wake Jesus up, and uh, they tell Jesus, we're all going to die, right? Now, this is the Son of God. God, he came with a plan and a purpose. And by, then, by now they should have known nobody can touch us because Jesus is here on a mission and we know what the mission is. And so Jesus has got to live. And if he's going to live, we're probably going to live with him because we're all in the same boat. So what he did is he stood up. And uh, this is a, a great picture here in, here in uh, Mark 4.39. And uh, it's, a, it's great. I'll just, I'll just read this. He got up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, be quiet be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Isn't that great? I mean, have you ever been out on a boat and the waves are up and down and, you know, you, you know, the ripple effect, you know, and, and it just, Jesus stood up and said, stop, be calm. Just stop. And what happened? The wind stopped, the water died down, boom. It was perfect. It was, he was God and he was in control of the water, the storm, the wind. Guess what? He's still in charge of the wind and the storm and the obstacles of our lives. If only we're willing to let him help us be still. Okay? Let me just read this here. Uh, and I, I love this version. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. This, I love the idea of this great calm. So what I love about that is this. When he said, peace be still, in our lives, sometimes we need to be still. Guys, how often are you still? We're always moving, aren't we? There's always something to do. How often are we, are, do we find time to just be still and alone with God and allow God to speak to us? How often do we do that? You see, it's only when we cease from our activities in the flesh and trust him in the spirit to guide us and direct us to our lives. And that means not trying to fix something, not try to figure it out, just be still and quiet. Listen to what the word of God has to say to us. And so it's only when we're, we let him calm us can we truly see him for who he is and what he is trying to do. But how often do we do that? How often do we stop and just listen for the stillness of God and just find that? And so Jesus stood up, he rebuked the wind and the sea, and of course they were all in awe. They were all amazed. I would be amazed at that. I have that picture actually in my office uh, hanging on the wall of Jesus standing in the boat like this, and the sea is just perfectly calm. And, and I wish, you know, the picture included the pictures of the disciples in the boat like, you know, like the scream, you know, like, you know, and, and, and that is the God who wants to work in our hearts today. But we have to sometimes in this storm come back to, the, to this reality of this, is do I, do I love the Lord? Am I seeking the Lord? Is he the center of my life? Does he have the preeminence in my life? So real men need to continue to nurture that love for God because if that doesn't happen, we're wasting our time. And we need to humble ourselves, realize we need to just come before him on our knees and in the total dependence that he's doing something. I may not know exactly what he's doing, but it's a total dependence. I can't do it, only he can do it. I'm at the end of my rope, here I am, Lord. And then, and then standing firm and allowing God to, to give you the strength to stand firm against the wiles and the schemes of the devil. Those things that the devil throws at us, guys, like, you know, just, you know, suck it up or be, don't, don't be afraid or, or you know, um, don't worry about money or whatever or, you know, or whatever it is to not allow those schemes to distract us. And then this idea of, of uh, not giving up. What I've included in, in your handout today is uh, some verses that, guys, I'd like to encourage you to take home. And if you don't have one of the bulletins today, grab one on the way out. But uh, these are a number of verses, about 30 verses, I think 20 or 30 verses, on um, things that we can read and memorize. These are great verses. And, I, and one of the things that can help you guys the most is to memorize Scripture. Memorize Scripture. You can start with short verses like, Jesus wept. 
Okay? All right. So, yeah, okay. Those are, you can memorize that one, right? Um, uh, but, but the reality is, and, I, and I, the first one here is um, Ephesians 4.27, and give no opportunity to the devil. Okay? Um, in uh, 2 Corinthians, skip down your, and this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. And this next one, Proverbs 3, 6. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. So as you spend time with God memorizing scripture, and you know, write it down on a three by five card, shove it in the back or put it on your phone, whatever. And I just encourage you like once a, once a day, just look at that or, or, or whenever, not when you're driving, but at lunchtime or whatever, look at the scripture verse in the morning, evening, whenever, and try to start memorizing more and more scripture and allowing the word of God to just roll around in your head and in your heart. And that's what begins to truly transform our lives. It's only really the word of God that's really going to transform our lives. All the experiences you have in life are great, but it's time alone with God, being still and allowing him to work in your heart. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today as fathers, as men, and, and I know not everybody here is a father, but we thank you, Father, that you've given us a, f- a format, a blueprint. You've given us your scripture as the, as the manual, the guide, the owner's manual to help us understand things. And Lord, help us as we seek you first in our lives to really depend upon you and to trust you for all the things that you're doing in our lives. Thank you, God, that you have a plan for our lives not to harm us, but to help us, to help us to grow closer to you, to be more dependent upon you. You're not looking for just a bunch of independent guys doing their own thing, but you're looking to us to seek you with all our heart, mind, and soul. And so, Father, thank you for giving us Jesus, because if it weren't for your son coming to earth and humbling himself as a man to take away our sin, we never would have the relationship we have with you. But because of that, we have this wonderful, vibrant living relationship with a loving God who gave himself for us. So, Father, help us to seek your word. Help us to seek to know you more and more. Help us to turn to you first rather than last. Help us to realize, Father, that that it's okay not to understand or know what exactly is going on. And help us to understand that we can't fix things. We can't fix anything apart from you. But thank you for your son Christ. Thank you, Father, for loving us before the foundation of the world. Thank you for reaching out to us, but with your son Christ. As the scripture tells us, we were God-haters. We were people who had no desire to know you, but because of your grace and your mercy and the work of the Holy Spirit, we're here today. So, Father, help us. Thank you, and I pray you just bless the dads today that you would encourage their hearts as you draw them closer to you in the precious name of Christ. Amen.